she wanted to eclipse that image of being just the Chinese, the Asian, the exotic female lady. She wanted to become an actress where her ethnicity had nothing to do with it. When it came to playing roles that are written for white females, she could not be considered. It's very hard for Hollywood audiences to relate to someone whom they know is not going to get the guy. She cannot have the kind of love interest that ultimately would give her stardom. It's ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. Ticklish Business, the podcast devoted to honoring and deconstructing classic cinema. I am Drea Clark, and with me this week are, as ever, Kristen Lopez. And we have an incredibly special guest today. We're delighted to have her in general, but particularly for this film. This is Please Welcome, Nancy Wong Yoon. Hello. Hi. So happy to be here with you both. (laughs) We are very delighted to have you. We have a film that I think all three of us are anxious to talk about. Anxious might be the best word for me because I've been looking forward to this so heavily since I've seen the film. It was a new one for me and probably not for you guys. And I think that blend of things is always welcome. The film is Daughter of Shanghai and it stars the incomparable Anna Mae Wong who blew me away and I freaking just love to see talented people do their thing and I think she really got to in this one. So we're looking forward to digging into that, into her career and I'd also like to shout out to our Patreon. You may or may not know our road to 100 has been a long time coming. This is 100 episodes for Ticklish Business that we're going to be celebrating. And on Patreon, we have even more that we're doing to market, including two completely separate bonus podcasts, pins, and the return of movie watch parties. You can learn more at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. And please join us there if you're able to. It is one of the ways we keep this going in addition to just our sheer excitement over what we talk about. So with that, let's dig into today. Kristen, why don't you pop off first and tell, I, I'd love to hear either your, yeah, how do you know, have you seen this movie before? Is this something you were already psyched about? I had not seen this before. I had gotten an opportunity. I think they screened this at the Billy Wilder Theater in Westwood, maybe back at the beginning of March before the shutdown. And I didn't go. And I was very, very upset that I did not see this on a big screen. This is part of a tribute that they were doing for Asian Americans in Hollywood. So thankfully, though, I was able to watch this as part of Turner Classic Movies tribute to Asian Americans in Hollywood. And in conjunction with having just watched the PBS documentary called Asian Americans, which Nancy did some great threads on Twitter about that. And so it was really a great amount of time for me to really immerse myself in not just Anna Mae Wong, but the way that Asian American characters were portrayed in Hollywood and how Daughter of Shanghai is really an outlier in that sense. It's a story that is a mystery story about a Chinese American woman played by Anna Mae Wong, whose father is murdered as part of this human trafficking ring. And so she goes undercover to solve the murder, stop the smuggling, and she's teamed up with a police officer played by Philip Ahn. And I had never seen that before. I had seen anime Wong movies. I haven't seen her silent output, but I had also seen a movie that the name escapes me right now, where she plays a fortune teller, and it's also a mystery story that was also a lot of fun. It was stereotypical in many ways, but it was, again, great to see anime Wong playing this woman of action who is allowed to have this name narrative. And I really enjoyed this movie. It definitely exoticizes the locations, those those opening credits. It starts with a gong effect, which anytime you see that, you kind of have to roll your eyes. But at the same time, what it undoes about what was going on in Hollywood in the late 1930s is so revolutionary, even though as you're watching it, you're remembering that I think this came right after anime Wong had been passed over for the good earth. So this was kind of a consolation prize, but it's such a good movie for her. And it just makes you frustrated that she didn't get to continue that trajectory. 
Yeah, this yeah. film is really incredible because they are American characters. I think Anna May Wong had been playing, I don't know, she's been playing, she played a slave girl in that one um, movie with, was it Douglas Fairbanks? I think she kind of epitomized the dragon lady and even the lotus blossom. I think her, her literal first role was called Lotus Flower. And so the fact that she is playing an American character, and even in the film, a white actor asks her, are you American born? Like that was his first question. Like Asian Americans don't even get that question today. <laughs> we don't get asked, are you American born? We get, where are you from? So the fact that somebody wrote in like, oh, you know, are you American born? She's like, she's like, yep, San Francisco. It was definitely ahead of its time. And I think trying to signal that, hey, it's possible that there are Asian Americans born and raised in the United States. So I really appreciated that line and just both she and Philip on are speaking English and with fluency and typical American accents, not, you know, any kind of invented Asian accents, which were, which was totally popularized by all the yellow face, right? Including, I mean, Anna Mae Wong played, I think it was, this is called Daughter of Shanghai, but she played Daughter of the Dragon, where her father is played by some white actor. There were a couple of them that played Fu Manchu. And so the fact that she is actually speaking just like any, in fact, her, her, her voice and her accent is just beautiful. I mean, she spoke many, many languages, so she was very, very talented. What I really noticed about this movie and having watched it after I saw Piccadilly, which is Anna Mae Wong playing the scullery maid turned cabaret singer who is very much exoticized for being this exotic other. And then I also watched The Crimson Kimono, which is a very different type of film but also has Asian Americans in prominent noir positions. I think that what I was really struck by is her introduction in this movie. Her father is an antique stealer, and she is just as competent as him in that regard of knowing her stuff and being a businesswoman in some sense. And yet when she's on this freighter and, and has to pretend to be this rough, tough woman who can dance and all of that. She still holds her own, but she doesn't start in that role. She's an educated woman who is, her background is based in history. I think that's really fascinating. It's in in antiquities, which is predominantly a white sphere. I found her such an interesting correlation to a future Indiana Jones with the idea of like the archaeologist who has to turn detective because of something. And this film blew me away. The other films I've seen her in weren't as directly Asian American, like you said, emphasis on American. And the difference that makes in perception and also in all of the agency that's afforded to her character throughout this is kind of incredible. And I also appreciated that it started in San Francisco, a town that does have a very large Asian and Chinese specifically population. It makes sense. Most stories in San Francisco should have Asian characters, if not leads. So the buildup from the beginning was lovely. And I also heard the gong and I was sort of braced for that. But even the score, you know, a lot of these films, you get that horrible the equivalent of that commercial, like it literally would be called like an Asian song rather than culturally specific or regionally specific. I was braced for a lot of that to be threaded through to like exoticize or to, oh, remind us. And instead, I felt like every turn, especially for the time, it was given just the dignity of character that these people were, both for her and for Philip Ahn, who I thought was a fantastic leading man. And even the two of them, I appreciated that Nancy alluded to the accents that they were able to have in this film that were felt authentic for those characters, but also beautifully articulate, talented people. And that he was a police officer assigned to it. I, especially from the kind of feminist angle, really liked that Anna's character in this was allowed to, I spoke of agency, but just lead her own path. And she sets off, she does these things, she's kind of fearless. And what she undertakes, she gets to this place that's eventually sort of this dancing brothel, a brothel that dances. And even that, I thought I was truly just waiting for like a horrifyingly sexualized fan dance or something. And instead, what she was doing felt both believable to whatever sort of dance experience she would have 
who who knows what dance experience any of us have, but she just looked beautiful. It wasn't super creepy. You know, sometimes there's this thing of, oh, I get it. You want this character to have to like sexualize herself, but what we're also doing is ogling her as an audience. And this I didn't. Like I felt she was given respect throughout and I mean, that would stand out to me if this film was made this year, which is pathetic because it should just be built in at this point. For this film to be made when it was and to have that threaded through was like, oh, I felt I was always like ready to cringe. And then the cringes didn't come. It was just enjoyment. (laughs) Did that resonate with either of you? I, yes, I thought that actually what cringed me was the white woman dancing in some sort of Latin American <laughs> context. I think she was, because the music was kind of, in Agreed. that era, the kind of Latin American, the, the Latin lover trope was so rampant. And to have this blonde white woman kind of dancing in this sort of trying to look Latin, you know, quote unquote Latin was the word that they used back then. It just was, it was, it was cringy, right? It wasn't, it wasn't even that nice. Like she didn't even do it that well. So for Anna May Wong to come in and and do this. I mean, it was still exoticized and it had this like kind of like incense that was burning, <laughs> which um, I don't know if that was, there was some sort of symbolism there, but she was kind of hidden and I, and her identity was kind of hidden, right? Because she was undercover. It did feel like she was in control. And I think that that was because she took on that identity as dancer. That was the one that she decided to do. And she was always the one that was taking the lead. Like there were so many scenes. I mean, I've seen, I feel like all the shows now and movies, it's like when women and men are alone, there's going to be some like sexual assault or something. Right? I was kind of, I mean, it's not going to happen in that era, but the fact that like, because she goes in the middle of the night to like sneak around and then pretend that she's asking him for a drink. And earlier he had grabbed her arm. Remember that? So I was just like, oh my gosh, something terrible is going to happen. But instead they just have a chat and he asks if she's American born. I mean, it was kind of a, an interesting scene where actually I felt like it was more forward than so many of the shows and movies I watch now where women are always victimized. So I think I found that very refreshing. The threat of sexual violence in this movie is weird because there's that scene where she does sneak in completely without guile and has that interaction with the captain that she's very very quick on her feet and then at the same time when she gets on the freighter and she falls asleep and her hair falls out of her hat and the guys realize that she's a woman and they immediately start attacking her and it becomes like this 15 on one fight those are moments where I kind of was like anime I don't I think you thought this through well enough because that element of her femininity is what gets her in trouble. And at the same time, there's still this, as much as all the men, you know, Philip Bond's character tries to save her and stop it. It isn't until the captain, the white guy shows up and says, hey, what's going on? But this is a movie that definitely doesn't keep emphasizing her as sexual But there is, I think, more of an uptick in fear of sexual violence than in other movies. And I'm wondering how much of that was related to the fact that she wasn't a Caucasian woman. Yeah, no, you're totally right. How could I forget that scene? (laughs) That was so violent. (laughs) But it was so interesting because she was dressed like a man in that scene. And just one hair falls out. I mean, it's like... That could have been a cue. Like, how did you know that was a that was a, that was a woman just from that? It was a very simple. I, I thought I had to roll my eyes a little bit when she comes out with the, just her hat and her hair up, and I was like, "If you don't think that's a woman, come on, guys." Right. I mean, I know Philip Bond gives her a pass because he's trying to get her on the boat, but the other guy standing there, I was like, "Dude." Anybody can see that that is a beautiful woman right there. She still has her stage makeup on. Yeah, she's this tiny, beautiful woman. Like, I'm sure. I'm sure that hat is too. It's it's the Superman glasses all over again. Her um, hat was like a woman's hat, too. <laughs> it was like a, right, like really a fashionable or hat. It wasn't like yeah. a man's like cap, like the way the one that Philip on wore. <laughs> she was just like, it was like she just decided, I'm still gonna look beautiful. It doesn't matter what scene I'm in, I have to look fashionable. <laughs> He, sh- he should have given her his, his hat. I loved the, you know, speaking again of her and Philip Allen's characters, I always have this habit of shortening their first names. Like I'm friends with them. Like Philip, you know, when Philip is uh, doing this thing. But the, when Philip Allen's character and her interact, it's nice because there are several points when you kind of assume that they're going to sort of really start working together or something. And it's much later. I just, she is allowed to be her own boss 
for so much of this movie. I'm honestly, I'm not a remake person, but I was like, oh, if someone please remake this, if only because I want to see another Asian woman be able to have this kind of agency. You guys, I do a, do a, have a drink on me every time I say the word agency, that it's consistent and that she just really calls her own shots. And going back to the beginning, you know, we were talking about the very detective-y structure of this and her father's in antiquities and he's sort of, he also is wonderful and sleuthing out this criminal element and all of these people are being sort of, there's like a mob element, but they don't know who's at the head of it and he's trying to track everything. And he has this ledger where he has been out there interviewing people himself and I also liked that the father was seen in this way of being proactive and a solid member of his community and like ready to stand up and fight for the good of his area. But also they're captured. The father is killed and she takes command from that moment on. Like she escapes a car where she's about to be thrown into the water. The action in this film was the other thing that I was not expecting. And you guys, I know, shun me or strike me with lightning whenever I say remake. But I was like, this is an action film with this great female lead. Like, why? This is, we remake all sorts of really terrible movies that could be very easily avoided. But come on, they jump out of a plane at one point. No, they don't jump out of a plane. They hold on when she and Philip on are finally escaping. There's just all of these fun, interesting beats. And they all tie back to the other thing that I love in talking about the female empowerment of this movie for the good and the bad. One of the threads that we uncover the whole time is there's this very small nod at the beginning. There's this other wealthy white woman in the area. She's befriended their family and they're actually on their way to a dinner at her home when the car is ransacked and then the fathers have killed that night and they end up there and in the very subtle reveal that's hinted early on and I'm sure any woman watching when someone says there's just a small thing early of like I feel women knew instinctively oh no that woman she's the big bad but then it doesn't of course come out till the very end but there was also something wonderful about that that it's not the creepy guy who runs the brothel and like does the it's there's a woman who's running this whole enterprise and calling all these shots and is terrible and like that reveal as well. I was telling you, I mean, I've been waiting for two weeks now to talk about my love of this movie. The amount of times I was like, yeah, <laughs> that's how you do it. Well, no, you bring up a lot of really good points. You know, this was directed by Robert Flory, not a big name in terms of director, predominantly known for helming nearly every early television show that a, an actor did. You know, Loretta Young show, he did Jane Wyman show. He's best known movie-wise for helming The Coconuts with the Marx Brothers, which is a very different movie than this one. But the script was, is credited to Lattice Unger and Garnett Wilson, both of whom died relatively early in the 1940s. Lattice Unger, this was her last completed screenplay before she passed away. And then Garnett Wilson would also retire from films relatively quickly in the 1950s, but was best known for bringing the noir element. He was the man behind a lot of the Bulldog Drummond scripts, so you can see where that element came from. But you're totally on point with Cecil Cunningham's character, Mrs. Mary Hunt. I think that the minute that character drops the artifice, her face changes, she drops the smile, she starts talking kind of like a hooligan. It's different because if you have watched a lot of villainesses of the 30s and 40s. They're particularly masculine. You know, I think of the 1940s women in prison films, you know, where everybody is kind of coded as lesbian. There's not that here. There's nothing masculine about her. She is specifically weaponizing her role as a white, wealthy woman to traffic humans. And I think that's the shocking thing. This movie opens with a young Anthony Quinn playing the co-pilot of this plane and they're going to be caught by an airplane and they decide to quote-unquote dump their cargo, which we find out. We actually see them dump humans into the ocean. And that's really the stakes of this movie. The movie doesn't dwell on that, but that's unignorable as you watch this movie. It's what they're trying to stop is the illegal trafficking of humans, something that in 2020 we still see in so many ways. And that's shocking to me. And it's similar to what, when we talked about Freaks, which had just come out a couple years before this. 
freaks in that movie, everybody who is normal, quote unquote, or able-bodied is either a villain or at least sees them in a derogatory fashion. And this is somewhat similar, especially with the the Mary Hunt character, but even some of the other characters, I think of her her Man Friday, the, the chauffeur that ends up being a cop in some way. It wasn't, I was really unclear about, he says his dad was a cop, but I wasn't really sure if he like, was just some rogue chauffeur or he actually was a police officer in some form, but he turned coats on his employer and saves the day. And even then, it seems like he takes a bit more credit at the end. So like even at the end, the good, quote unquote, good white people, good the good Caucasians are still a little self-angredizing about themselves. I think that, yeah, you you bring up Anthony Quinn and it's probably one of the most diverse films of that time because you have Anthony Quinn who's Latino and then you have a black man servant who actually is not very, I didn't feel like, I mean, he's obviously still stereotyped, but it wasn't as bad as it could have been. He was seen as loyal and good and he had some lines that were zingers about like, you know, why can't we get a really nice car? Why do we have to take the taxi so I can drive? He doesn't talk in that affected accent that a lot of unfortunately black performers had to speak. Yeah, so you have actually Asian, Black, Latinx, and that one chauffeur slash ex-police officer, he was a white ethnic character, right? I think he was very obviously Irish. And so that's something that I think was probably met more back then than it does now, because Irish, you know, as maybe people of uh, people who know about immigration history, they were not seen as white for a bit, and they were actually excluded from businesses, and they were seen as second class. And so to have a white ethnic character be an ally to other characters of color is actually historically interesting. And yeah, and I think that this movie, because it has a female protagonist and an antagonist, actually more than passes the Bechdel test in terms of speaking. I mean, romance wasn't even brought up until the very, very end. (laughs) We're going to talk about that romance angle at the end, because that was the the one slight against this movie that I had. (laughs) Agreed. I think that it came out of nowhere of, well, well, she has to get married at the end for it to work out. But the the one redeeming thing is that they actually code switch into Cantonese and it's like authentic. It feels like, okay, they are Asian, they're Chinese American characters and they're they're speaking, you know, with typical American accents. And at the end, when they're actually going to talk about something very, very intimate, like, do you want to get married? They actually code switch a little bit. and, And I felt like that was actually really revolutionary to see that on camera. But yes, the kind of feminist, like, why would she have to get married? And it doesn't, they don't actually build up their romance um, at all, which if they did, maybe it would have made more sense. But yeah, what, what do you guys think about the, the relationship? It, yeah, no, it's interesting because I also just have to, I, Philip on was so dreamy in this and I would have been... I mean, not to just like sexually objectify all of the actors we talk about, but actors are often pretty dreamy and he's no exception. So I would have been delighted to have a little more of like that spark between them throughout. However, I was such in deep enjoyment, as you know, of her being able to be this very individual and self-sufficient woman. And a lot of times, as soon as there's like, we've paired up and there's a spark again talk about indiana jones it becomes more the woman is like his sidekick or like he's carrying her along and i didn't want that i really loved watching her excel in what she was doing and i do wonder this film to me does so much great work in like i said and i say this from i wasn't around when this was made but even now a lot of these things are still noteworthy so the work that it was doing in terms of some kind of equality on screen or representation that was out of the box. I wonder if, did they curtail any of the romance between them? I want to think it was to keep the attention on her as a strong character, but there's always the concern of, oh, did you do it because the idea of these two Asian American leads flirting or being sexualized or romantic didn't fit whatever, like, were they asking too much of an audience or something, you know, horrifyingly obnoxious like that? I don't know. I would have really liked them to flirt so I could have seen it. And also because that ending, I was like, um, what then? Who's getting married? Why? Like, was very out of nowhere. And also, she doesn't need to get married. She can just see a moving car. She's fine. 
It's funny, um, Dre, if you're looking for more dreamy dudes in Asian American films, I mentioned it earlier. I just finished The Crimson Kimono. And if you if you want some like more smooth lines, James Shigita in that film is really awesome, like old school detective. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right. Yeah, um, but that- Nancy literally just made a fanning motion. That's all. I- <laughs> I'm sold. It's on Criterion Collection, I think. If uh, in their their Columbia Noirs, so so watch it. It's really really good. He's awesome. But Philip on. I find it hilarious, and by hilarious, I mean kind of offensive to him as an actor that the credits list him last, and he's pretty much the side character. Like, he's on equal footing with everybody else, and anime, you know, gets... I think, like, they put, like, Buster Crab and a couple other people above him who just kind of play heavies. That is nonsense. As someone who's had to do the few indies that I've produced, the negotiation for credit listing is absolutely part of what you're doing when you're setting these up. And I didn't watch that or see that part because I would have been incensed. It's not just insulting, but it also means in the negotiation level. It's like anything else, the value that you're giving to a performer or saying they're bringing to the table. That's kind of yeah incredibly disappointing. Well, at the same time, Philip Bond, you know, and I got all this off of the courtesy of PBS, their Asian American documentary, but they did a whole section on Philip Bond, who is kind of a controversial figure because he was a Korean actor who, this is one of the rare films that he got to play kind of the, the leading man dashing figure. But when I believe it was Japanese internment started, many different groups of of Asian Americans who were not Japanese, but Chinese American, Korean American, essentially did whatever they had to to portray themselves as quote unquote good Americans. And Philip Ahn became the representative of the bad Japanese person in different movies. He would play the villain in World War II films and, and stuff like that. He made a career out of playing specifically Japanese baddies. And that caused a lot of controversy, especially later in his, his legacy. And it's a shame because I think he's really got a good, charming charisma here. He's got good chemistry with, with anime Wong. You can believe that he's a police officer. He's a man of few words, but like who hasn't seen a police officer character in a movie that's not known for being like light and jovial. You know, not every cop needs to have a wisecrack handy. And I think that works. You know, he works in a way when he's in that little cap and the black sweater and he's like investigating. He's like John Garfield. You know, he's like any A-list actor that's kind of doing doing a part and I know that when I watched the Crimson Komodo intro with Nancy Kwan, she talked about how it was a lot harder for Asian actors to sell themselves as leading men than it was Asian actresses because it was easier to sexualize, I guess, an Asian woman than it was to, you know, I don't know what the exact specifications were, but a lot of Asian American actors never really got to be leading men in this capacity. Nancy, I know you, we didn't bring it up and, and I want to because it's it's fantastic. You actually looked at inequality in film. You wrote a book about it. Can I actually go back to Philip on a little bit? Yes, please. Yeah. So, um, so I actually participated in the Asian Americans documentary. I actually spoke on Anime Wong and actually I was interviewed about Philip on, but I it didn't make it to the final. There was so much. I also talked about Moral Oberon. So there was a slew of classic Asian American actors. Um, now I just need deleted scenes, please, because I want to see all that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so Philip on his father and, and in the documentary, they talk about this. His father was a revolutionary in Korea. Korea was actually in war with Japan. And so Philippon intentionally played these Japanese villains as part of the propaganda against Japan because we were at war with Japan. And he saw it as his duty because his sister... Oh gosh, what is her name? Uh, Susan, Susan Cody, uh, Susan, Susan on Cody. She was like, a, she was in the military and had a really high rank and was fighting in her own way on behalf of the United States. So they were uh, very much involved in the way that they could be in terms of patriotism. And so that was, I mean, Philip Bond has a very colorful background and family. And, and so I, I wanted to say also that the marriage thing, I think that's one of the reasons why they got married is because 
I'm guessing, <laughs> because Anna Mae Wong never got to get married in any of her films because of the Hays Code, right? Because even if she was the object of uh, lust or, you know, in some sort of her first film, it was sort of a Madame Butterfly story. She just always never got the guy and usually died by the end. And so I think the fact that she and Philip Ahn could actually have that marriage, even though by today's sensibilities is kind of strange and maybe even problematic in terms of her own career and ability to kind of get married in one of her films and also like she never married in life and partly because of the uh, I mean there's lots of reasons probably why but the anti-miscegenation laws and she was so kind of modern and had her own career she didn't want to have the traditional marriage and and also there were talks of that maybe she was queer as well right and so we don't know uh, we don't we'll never know what her what her kind of sexuality is but we know for sure that she never got to get married in most of her movies and so this perhaps was something that she wanted I'm so glad you brought that up because, of course, I remember that in the back of my head and when we're talking about it. Yeah, the idea, again, it's if you're a modern audience member and you're not cognizant of those things or film history, it's ludicrous enough that an interracial couple wouldn't be able to kiss. But that said, look how many... (laughs) We're only now seeing more interracial couples cast as leads anyway. Again, however many decades later. So, but the idea that it was built in as law, that is fair. I will give that up. The idea that she wasn't even allowed to have this kind of, she could have the romance of it, but they couldn't kiss and they could, she couldn't interact in a very believable, loving way with her co-star so often if they were white actors. And that's, yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. And also Philip on We've seen a lot of times of different nationalities all playing like, oh, you're Asian, so you can play Korean, you can play Japanese, you can play Chinese. And there's something interesting there because, of course, you want actors to have the fluidity of taking on a variety of roles. It's certainly like for white people, like I'm of English descent, but I can play Swedish. Like they're fine. You would hope that someone would have access to a lot of possible roles. But there's also the whole thing of seeing an entire people as a monolith and not knowing like the idea of Japan and Korea having tensions, particularly at that time, and all of the subtext of what it could mean. And the idea of Philip on taking on these Japanese roles as a way to honor his own heritage and an ongoing problem. Like that's, it's just such an, a rich texture of things. And what people are bringing to the table when you're not exploring them is it's such a loss to not be able to dig into things and really get to that. I didn't know. I mean, I was obviously aware of the Korean Japanese conflict, but the idea of, I don't know, Philip Bond's family or all of that, like that's such a great angle of history. So thank you, Nancy, for that. Would you guys, I would love to hear more about your own um, knowledge, which is much vaster than mine, of Anna Mae Wong's other work as well and her trajectory in Hollywood. Because, you know, we've spoken about some of her films and some of the things that were holding her back in terms of like these romances or whatever else. But, you know, she was such a distinctive character and made such a mark for herself. And I think as much as I love this film as a wonderful showcase of what she did, she certainly has such a ranging history. Nancy, what's your, obviously, as the most knowledgeable and published knowledge here, I would love to hear your background with her. So my research is actually on contemporary actors. And so learning about her and seeing all the beautiful photos and footage of her. And then I think what stands out about her is that there were so many obstacles. I think I love this film because I think this is one of the few films that actually showcases her well, because most of her roles, like I said, are dragon ladies, you know, just women who kill themselves, you know, for no apparent reason, except that she's Asian and she can't live throughout the whole film. And, but then she was very outspoken. And so this is what I love studying um, actors of color because I think for that time, she was incredibly defiant in her interviews. Like she said things like, why do we, you know, Chinese who have a civilization so much older than the West, why are we always seen as the villains? Right. And so it's like, and she would joke like on my tombstone, I'm going to have, you know, died a thousand deaths because that's what happened to me. So she was humorous. She was, she didn't hold back on the fact that, yeah, that she didn't want to take the concubine role when she didn't get the main role in The Good Earth. 
because it's like, why should I, the only one with Chinese blood, play this like, you know, villainous role and also a minor role? So she was very outspoken, which even when I was interviewing actors of color, a lot of times they didn't want to speak out because they were worried about their careers. And I think as the first Chinese American actress, she didn't, I mean, she probably already thought, what more can I lose? I'm already not getting enough roles. And so she was probably one of the first international stars. She was the first international Chinese American star where she then went on to Europe, where, you know, Kristen talked about Piccadilly, right? Where she went to Europe. She also went to China. She tried to, she had a cabaret act in Europe. So she sang and she had, she knew multiple European languages. She picked them up. And so she was very much a self-made woman in an era where if you see her films, she's stand out, but the characters themselves are all heavily stereotyped. So she really just did so much within a very, very limited capacity. Well, and it's amazing too. She started working in films at the age of 19 and dropped out of high school to become an extra. And you know, when you look at the accomplishments that she made, she was one of the first women that I know. I'm sure there were other women, but it's certainly the first Asian American woman to form her own production company. You know, she's formed Anime Wong Productions so that she could make movies that, that she wanted to make. But so much of the Hayes Code prevented her from doing anything unless she could find another Asian man in the U.S. that she could kiss and, and stuff like that, which is why, again, I keep shilling for the Crimson Kimono, watching that movie in 1959, where you have an interracial relationship. Even then, the, the kiss is reserved for the last 30 seconds of the movie in case somebody objected and they had to cut it. So even by the late 50s, there was still this hesitancy to portray interracial relationships between Asian Americans and Caucasian performers. And I think that that's shocking for a lot of people to hear because for a long time, you know, the Asian community just in general, you know, there's this, there's always been this controversy because there is that element of, well, they're still white in, in the sense that they're not dark pigmented and where that relationship has been. And again, please watch the Asian Americans documentary because there's an insanely frustrating and intelligent story about how Indian Americans from India would, would try to dissociate from being labeled black because the worst thing was to be black on the spectrum. And so they would try to be, they weren't Caucasian, obviously. They weren't white enough to be white people, but they still had that extra. So the way that the taxonomizing of race and ethnicity in America is just insane and how long it went on. How long, I mean, what what we still see today, what we're seeing right now, it's nuts for lack of a better word. And anime Wong, I think is always going to be the representative of the, the woulda, coulda, shoulda. You know, we have Ryan Murphy's Hollywood right now, which attempts to kind of showcase what might have been had Anime Wong been allowed to have those leading roles. And, you know, say what you will about how that well that would have gone down. But it is sad to know that the loss of the good earth really did kind of put her on this spiral of just kind of being like, well, I can't do anything. What more can I do? And she campaigned for the secondary role and she realized she wasn't going to get the the lead. And even then, it was almost like a punishment that she didn't get that. So watching anime Wong movies, they're great. What, what ones are easily available? You know, it's shocking that there's not that many that are easily accessible. And I've been trying really hard to find a good biography of her. And I've been kind of hitting a wall because a lot of them are either out of print and thus ridiculously expensive, or they're kind of, there's a you know, children's book, which is great, but I'm looking for something a little meatier. So that's, that's really hard. And I, I'm hoping that this resurgence in her name inspires more people to do more with her legacy because it's been a long time coming. You mentioned the kind of taxonomy. So, you know, if we go back to this film, looking back, I mean, the the Black character really is so problematic. And it is interesting that he's the servant of the Chinese family. So it is this kind of like hierarchical representation. And yeah, it's totally just kind of put it out there for sure, problematic and typical of the time period. And just because he's the quote unquote good, you know, Negro, the house Negro kind of character, it's still indicative of the horrible racism of the time and how Black actors, the limitations to the roles that they could portray. And so, so even in this kind of quote unquote progressive Asian American film, we still have really problematic representations of African-Americans. 
And so I think that there was this television show that she was in, that she starred in, that was supposed to be another detective, right? And, and actually it, it aired on television, but the, these, this footage, I mean, I feel like there needs to be a biopic on anime Wong because this footage all like got, apparently got tossed into the ocean, that entire TV channel. It was a Dumont, du was it called? Um, anyway. I, yeah, I think like it that. was, was it the gallery of Madame Lu Song? That's right. That's, that's right. Yeah, and from so, 1951. Yeah. Yeah. So she had this show, which was again, crazy revolutionary because what Asian American woman has her own TV show, but we have absolutely no evidence of it. We just know that it existed. And that she was supposed to star in a flower drum song, right? And instead, it's just interesting, the actress that took her place was a Black actress that played Chinese. So this kind of, you know, intersection of kind of got back and forth of putting in quote unquote ethnic actors in these roles. Hollywood is just uh, so, so, so horrendous about all that. But she was supposed to, you know, have her come back in that movie, Flower Drum Song, which if you guys haven't seen that, it's amazing, right? It's so problematic, but it's also the first studio Asian American and musical. And it has the beautiful James Shigeta, who was in Crimson Kimono, right? And it has Nancy Kwong. And so it's 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 basically the, it's, it was the crazy rich Asians of its time, right? With musical. <laughs> so, but, I mean, the songs are all, you know, they're all through a white lens. So, uh, but it was actually, the story was based on a Chinese, American novel about San Francisco. So I I think of it as that, tracing that to Joy Luck Club, tracing Joy Luck Club to um, Crazy Rich Asians, these kind of, you know, the the source material is actually Chinese American. And then the director, at least of Joy Luck Club and Crazy Rich Asians are also Chinese American. You can see the difference that that makes compared to Flower Drum Song. But Flower Drum Song has to be seen because it really was, I think, one of the first times you see a variety of Chinese American characters, some with immigrant accents, others with American accents, and kind of this East-West tension, generational tension, and catchy music, I guess, for the most part. <laughs> what do you guys think about I that? I actually, yeah, I just rewatched Flower Drum Song because it's on Canopy right now in Los Angeles. And I know Canopy has different offerings, whichever, wherever you're signed into it. And it's funny because I watched it after watching this and even that shifting of what I was wanting in terms of representation and not just representation of like casting, but how people are presented on screen. And there's certain films you're more aware of the white lens that you're talking about than other films. And I think that awareness is so crucial to anyone who's consuming media. It's nice to have As much as a lot of that awareness is ugly, but it's earned ugliness and you should have that built into how you're seeing things. But also you reminding me of that is I'm excited. That means I have already swooned over James. What's his, who's my new boyfriend? James Shigita. I can't wait. I can't, I'm going to be like, oh, that guy. (laughs) Love him. for, for modern audiences, in case you're curious, you might know him as Mr. Takagi from Die Hard, the first one. <laughs> Did not know that until I Googled, and I was like, oh, really? Okay. That's uh, really so throwing yeah. my crush for a loop. <laughs> Bill oh, Bond my. was in uh, Kung Fu, the series, the, the one with, <laughs> with Carradine. No. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I mean, you know, the the, the older act, the classic actors make their way into future stereotype shows. And, yeah, well, I mean, Die Hard is like whatever that is. But, um, <laughs> the Die Hard is its own thing. Kung Fu is such an example. Like, you know, we're talking about when Anime Wong was making this film and was like in her career, the concept of and the rampant problematic casting of white people in Asian roles. The idea that that wasn't just to a small point of time in history when you're like, ooh, they were doing this for a little, but then they learned their lesson because how horrifying. And instead, it not only continued for decades, but on a very large scale, like on in very famous movies, on TV shows that ran for so long. It's such, like I'm talking about having an awareness of that lens and of how that perspective a, a white perspective skewed things in a way that that tried to and did normalize for many people who would watch and not see the red flags of it. To do that, you have to build it through media, through years. And I just can't imagine putting that much work into trying to do something terrible. Well, it's, um, it's important to point out, I mean, we've had so many examples of bad Asian representation. I mean, of course, everybody's go-to nowadays is Mickey Rooney, 
in Breakfast at Tiffany's, but I mean, I was just watching Austin Powers, the third one, and they have, you know, sexy Asian twins, you know, dressed up as schoolgirls with weird names and like, ha ha ha, that's funny. And that was from you know, the early 2000s. So, you know, I say this a lot when I say this about just dis- whether it's when I'm talking about disability representation or representation in general, media has such an important role in shaping how we learn about people who are not like us. And you don't know what you don't know. And then if you watch a movie, you think like, oh, okay, I know about, if you watch 12 Years a Slave, you're like, okay, well, I know all that uh, there is to know about the African-American experience, you know? And I'm sure if somebody watches Daughter of Shanghai, they're going to be like, okay, well, and really Daughter of Shanghai, I'd love it if somebody starts with this because it really is an outlier. The, it's the exception, not the rule. It's funny, TCM tried very hard to do, you know, their Asian American slate of programming and a lot of things they had to say, no, it's, it's very cringy. It's very cringe inducing. You know, they showed um, Love is a Many Splendor thing, which I've seen. And if you haven't seen it, you don't need to. It's just a really good theme song and, you know, that's it. But it's, it's Jennifer Jones doing Yellow Phase in this tragic love story with William Holden. And I feel for the TCM peeps because they're stuck kind of having to put these movies in context and say, like, when you're showing so many movies, I, I was so happy that they were able to show exceptions to this, positive examples, and not just have it all be, look at Catherine Hepburn doing Yellow Face. Look at this person doing Yellow Face. You know, they're able to find those exceptions exist. And the sad fact is, is that especially for some studios, you know, there's no value in their classics already, let alone the classics that can maybe teach people stuff. There's never been, if, I, if memory serves, a proper anime Wong box set. You know, several of her films, unfortunately, are not available on DVD. I think most of her silent output, most silent films are missing, but I think a lot of her silent stuff is unfortunately not available. And it's sad because I think a lot of people will watch classic films or watch any film about the Asian American experience and just think that it's, they've learned that, oh, it's just stereotypical terrible yellow face internment world war ii like that's it those are the beats when unfortunately i don't think hollywood does a lot today to really shy away from those things nancy what what do you think i think we need a more asian american generated content right that's the stories that are coming out of the community and that's what's amazing about the documentary series is that the producers the people the talking heads actually most of them are asian american women and historians and i'm the token sociologist and you know the music the the score everybody involved are asian americans and actually after watching the first part we i had like a a talk with a lot of asian americans in the community and they were talking about one representation that was of someone who actually was a sort of a spy and they were like oh what, what's the general america gonna think about japanese americans and i just thought you know what i think that this documentary was made without that gaze without the intention that this would be seen for, that that's intended for a white audience that actually is intended to tell untold stories for the community And I thought, like, we don't have to worry about that because we've been worrying about that all of our lives, right? And I think that that's the difference between content that's actually coming from the community, by the community, for the community, story about the community. And I think that that as long as we have a wide breadth and depth of storytelling, that we don't have to worry about who is the intended audience because, you know, that's when we know we're free, that we can just tell our stories and not have to worry about an intended audience, even though I know Hollywood is all about that kind of market. But now we have such a diverse audience and also a global audience, right? Especially with all the streaming sites distributing globally. I think that we just need to tell good stories and tell untold stories. I think we just want new content, new stories. And there's so many untold stories within the Asian American community, both fictional and historical. The Asian American documentary, if you haven't seen it, you should go watch it. I, I believe it's available widely on PBS, but there are so many stories. That spy story you brought up. I mean, there's fodder for numerous movies, numerous films that I would love to see Asian Americans tackle and tell because, you know, there's much like African Americans can permeate every genre of film. And I think Asian Americans are the same way. Like, I need every genre of film here in the US as well. I mean, obviously, there's a wealth abroad, but I hope the Asian American documentary just inspires Hollywood to be like, there's our next 
multi-million dollar blockbuster right there because that would be really interesting. Uh, Dre, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, I think tied into this, which I fully believe the twofold of A, Asian Americans being able to tell their own stories rather than always just sort of plugged into, again, it's still the white lens even with a a multi-representational cast. I think that's key, but also the more that you have of that, the wider breadth there are of these stories told means that there's not so much onus on each film to represent an entire population. Or, you know, I was talking earlier of like the ill-conceived idea of a monolith. Like even just using Asian as a phrase is sometimes, to me, worrisome of, huh, I'm putting this whole swath of Asian identity as if my Japanese friend whose mother is French has the same life experience of my friends who are like fifth generation Korean Americans. And like, obviously they're not. So the more that's out there and the more widespread you get it, the less there is a make or break moment on any single film. And that said, I still want an Asian American filmmaker to remake Daughters of Shanghai only because you can see my deep love for it. And I can already envision many exciting Asian actresses getting the action and romance. But also, yes, original stories are best. I still, you guys, a dream. A girl has a dream. (laughs) Uh, Any other final things we want to touch on before we close it up? Just to watch this film for our discussion today, I had to borrow Kristen's sign-in for something. And I do think it is, I mean, again, true of so many films that are difficult to access, but it really is frustrating to me. The idea of this would be a great entry point for people who are just discovering Anime Wong, even from watching Ryan Murphy's Hollywood. Like, this should be a film you'd think would be Oh, maybe Nancy knows something I don't know. We we didn't even talk about Ryan Murphy's Hollywood because you know uh, Michelle Kruzik actually plays Anime Wong, and it's reimagined that Anime Wong you know actually has a chance at starring or co-starring in a movie, and actually wins the Academy Award that she was denied because we know that uh, Louise Rayner won for Olan in The Good Earth, which should have gone to Anime Wong. So I think we are all of a sudden having this kind of spot light on anime wong once again and it's exciting because her story is definitely one that is biopic worthy and it's tragic and she's also this early feminist and she's just amazing and i think that now is the time to to really get excited about her again and also actually uh, i saw daughters of shanghai for free on vimeo so if you go on Vimeo, there is a free version. So anybody can see it because it's really, I mean, it's 1937. Everyone should be able to just access it. So definitely everyone can see it. It's, it's only actually about what, 90 minutes? No, less something than that. like that. Yeah. Really it's short. pretty, it's pretty short. Well, I do want to throw out too that I want to say maybe about five or so years ago, there was talk about an anime Wong biopic. I have not heard anything else about it. So I don't know if that was just kind of maybe wishful thinking on a production company's head. So they just threw it out there and see what happens or what. But the, we've talked before, biopic, Hollywood biopics are very hard to get greenlit if they're not about white guys. We just did a discussion a couple weeks ago about Elizabeth Taylor and how even her story as a predominant A-list white woman still gets the TV treatment. It does not get the big screen treatment. And why is that? But you know, we can get a Dalton Trumbo biopic. Go figure. So yes, I thoroughly co-sign anime. More anime Wong. Do a biopic. Do something because I need more. Here, here. I'm glad you said that about Vimeo, Nancy. Thank you. I hope so many people also find that free link and check this out. Um, It is, to me, a very worthy movie and an enjoyable watch as well. I will Uh, throw it in the show notes. Oh, thank you, Kristen. Nancy, it was so wonderful to meet you and to talk with you and to be able to hear your thoughts on all of this. Where can people find you online and discover your writing and whatever else you're up to? So I uh, I kind of live on Twitter, especially now during the quarantine. <laughs> There's nowhere else to live. Um, so um, I'm at Nancy W Y U E N, and I wrote a book called Real Inequality R E E L. I love puns. Hollywood actors and racism, and it's probably one of the only books out there that really thoroughly goes through the inequality in Hollywood through both statistics and stories from actors. I interviewed over a hundred actors, and and I also compare white actors. I think 
think it's interesting because I don't want to just say, oh, actors of color have it bad. But I actually asked them all the same questions just to see whether there really was a difference in their experiences. And it truly was that white actors just didn't have the same kind of barriers and psychological costs and all that actors of color pay. So it's it's an interesting read. And actually, it was featured in the New York Times books this week because Michael Eric Dyson has it on his nightstand. So... <laughs> As somebody who's read it, if you need your ticklish business seal of approval, uh, I think it's awesome. So, must read. All right. It's going on my list. Congrats. I love the little nods that the New York Times have been doing to the books that are on other famous people's bookshelves right now. I have another friend that that happened to, and it's a true delight. Kristen, do you have any closing words? Daughter of Shanghai is great, and you should watch it. And then if you want to follow me, you can do that on Twitter at journeys underscore film. And yeah. Easy, succinct. Um, You can find me on also living on Twitter here during quarantine, quarantine at the Drea Clark. And then I also co-host a modern movie podcast called Who Shot Ya on Maximum Fun. I'd like to say such a double thanks to Nancy Wong Yoon for joining us today. That was delightful and you brought so much to the table and I can't wait to read your book. And that closes out this edition of Ticklish Business. You can find the podcast on Twitter at ticklish underscore biz. You can find me at the Drea Clark and you can download Ticklish Business wherever you get podcasts, Spotify, Apple, Sticker Radio, Player FM to name a few. You can also get exclusive pins, early episodes and entirely new shows on our Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklish biz. Yeah, and as always, we will be keeping everybody posted on what's coming up with our Road to 100. We are going to be talking next episode about Judy Garland's 1954 magnum opus, A Star is Born, with another very special guest. So, till next time.